title of our message is, What is God Like? During World War II, I was growing up. My older brothers, one of whom is here with me, were soldiers in the army. They fought against the enemy of our country. I have had a fascination with World War II ever since. I was too young to go, but I've always read and looked and listened. I have all of Cronkite's collection of videos on World War II. I'm just fascinated with it. But it was a long time before I read a thick book that I'd intended to read all along. It's called The Berlin Diary by William L. Shira. And I finished it cover to cover. There are people here who lived during that period. And you know that it was an awful, frightening time. And from time to time it comes back to our minds. This is anniversary year. And people are celebrating one thing or another all the time this year. Several years ago, I went to a Brauhaus in Munich, a beer joint. And it was in that beer joint where a supercilious and yet insignificant man climbed atop a table and began to drive a whole nation insane with his maniacal rhetoric. That man, the little corporal, became the chancellor of Germany. He became the Führer, the dictator of the Third Reich, Adolf Hitler, a name that blazes out of history with infamy. He became the scourge of the earth, the exterminator of millions upon millions of Jews and other undesirables. He was the author of the Holocaust. And I read that by fiat, when he took the reins in Germany, he dissolved the Constitution, took away all rights, and then determined as a dictator what the law would be all the constraints of the Treaty of Versailles were thrown aside by Hitler. And for one dark, dangerous period, this man made the world tremble and quake with fear. Adolf Hitler saturated Europe with blood. Before he put a bullet in his own temple, 50 millions of people had died Many of them, those whom he imagined to be the master race. The world still bows its head in shame at the enigma of Adolf Hitler and his twisted mind. At the legacy of Nazism. It has been a long time, but the world still remembers. I walked into the Holocaust Museum in Israel. And I silently went through the halls. And when I came to the pile of shoes taken from the victims of Auschwitz and Belsen Belsen and Dachau and other places and saw the infant shoes, I walked out of there and it seemed that for a half hour or so I couldn't speak. I didn't want to speak. So was I affected. Now they have a Holocaust Museum in Washington. I've already been twice. They have one on the West Coast. With all of that devastation and senseless murder, many of these murderers were brought to trial at Nuremberg. These Nazi criminals. And when they were sitting in the box, being tried for their crimes, one after another said, We didn't break any laws. We had to obey our government. Ladies and gentlemen, laws define governments and leaders. Laws tell us what nations and men are like. 
Hitler made laws to legitimize genocide, slavery, and every other, other conceivable evil. Laws that reflected his twisted dreams of a master race. He made laws that inflamed the passions of the Germanic people with their natural inclination toward glorious militarism. Ladies and gentlemen, if it were not for a higher law, then Hitler's rage against humanity would have been legitimate. I hope you're following what I'm telling you. Were there not a higher, holier law, God's moral law, were there not such a law, then whatever Hitler said was law would have been legitimate. The laws of the Third Reich tell us what Hitler was like. Our Constitution in the United States is a marvelous document. I preached about it not long ago. There are amendments guaranteeing freedom. Our Constitution is unique in the entire world. It has already lasted over 200 years. The average life of the average Constitution is 13 to 17 years around the world. Nations experience a coup. Leaders take over and they have a constitution for about 13 years. Then somebody kills them off and they get a new constitution. Ours has lasted over 200 years. Our laws tell us what America is like. And they tell us what the framers of the Constitution were like. Laws tell us what men are like. And right now, I could stand up here and quote our Constitution. In spite of the problems we have in America, we can still refer to that Constitution, lean on it, appeal to it, and stir your grand emotions. I thank God for America and its Constitution. Evil forces want to repeal it. Zealots want to interpret it. Today, we want to make new laws. Or rather, take that law and legitimize filth. Men appeal to our Constitution and its guarantee of freedom of speech to protect profanity, vulgarity, pornography, filthy books. This is the doing of man. It is not the spirit of the framers of the Constitution. Amen. What is God like? Laws tell us what nations and men are like. What is God like? The world today is extremely wicked and yet basically religious. There are more churches than ever before, more church goers, it seems, than ever before, and more preachers than ever before. If that is true, why all the corruption in our country? Why does it seem we're going to the dogs when we have more churches and preachers than ever before? I suggest it is largely because God is misrepresented even in church. The Bible says in Matthew 7 and verse 21, Not everyone, please don't miss this, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Everybody who preaches ain't going. Everybody who sings is not going. I better keep my English right. Everybody who prays and goes to church and gives money will not be going to heaven. Jesus said, 
Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he tells us who will enter. The rest of the verse says, But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. You want to know who's going? Those who commit themselves to Christ are saved by His grace and then do His will by the power of God. These are the words of Christ. Now, I like an audience that responds. I want to ask you some questions. And you just respond right out of the top of your head. Do you believe, I don't care whether he goes to church or not, do you believe that a man who steals and keeps on stealing is a Christian? Do you believe that a man who lies and keeps on lying is a Christian? Do you believe that a man who is unfaithful to his wife and commits adultery claiming, I couldn't help it. Do you believe he's a Christian? You see, you've answered the question correctly. And I tell you again, many are praying and shouting and singing and professing, but not doing God's will. And many don't have the foggiest notion of what God is like. We need a new concept of God. I have seen boxers go into the boxing ring and get on their knees and pray. Are they asking God to help them knock the daylights out of another man? If they are, they don't know God. The states have become gambling dens, lotteries with 12, 20, 40, 70, 100 million dollar prizes. They just had one for 70 million back east. And they said 36,000 tickets were sold every minute. And there are some churchgoers, not some, plenty of them, who get on their knees and they say, Lord, just help me to win this thing. And they want to make God a party to legitimized gambling. God is not a gambler. We need a higher Concept of God. Amen. The greatest enemy to Christianity is not an atheist or an infidel. It's a man who calls himself a Christian but will not do God's will. Amen. Young people say to me all the time, we are tired of abstractions. We're tired of this older crowd lecturing to us and yet not living what they say. Amen. They're tired of religion and its abstractions. They're tired of people who tell them what to do, but won't do right themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, I repeat, the biggest enemy to the cause of Christ is a man who professes to be a Christian, but lives the life of a common sinner. That man is declaring that God is righteous and holy, and at the same time denying that God is particular. They take a portion of God's will. The part that pleases them. They take a part of what God says that they don't have any trouble with. And they want to become fanatical about that. But that which rubs them the wrong, wrong way, that which cuts across their grain, they will deny. Yes. Thus, they show God as being a mixed up, unsure, haphazard. Willy nilly God. A God that only produces confusion. A God that nobody can follow. Therefore, every man wants to do what is right in his own eyes, the Bible says. When you talk to them and read to them out of the Bible, they will say, well, I, I see that, but it seems to me. Or, in my opinion. What good is my opinion when God speaks? A real Christian wants to hear a word from the Lord. And once he hears that, he wants to obey God. Doesn't matter who the messenger is. It is the message that God sends. Ladies and gentlemen, many people in many churches decide for themselves how they're going to live. And they don't care what God says. They have no 
plan for their lives other than their own opinions. They become laws unto themselves. But I want to repeat, laws tell us what men and nations are like, and God's law tells us what God is like. Remember this line. Remember this line. It is an inspired line. An inspired writer says, God's Ten Commandments are a transcript of His character. Would you say amen? Amen. You want to know what God is like? Read the Ten Commandments. They are an expression of His character. They tell us what His will is. And how he wants us to live so that we can be like him. If you understand that, would you say amen? Amen. Now, I ask my ushers to give you not only a quiz card, but a little piece of paper. And you keep your pencils until after I'm through. And if you'll leave them on the bench, that is sufficient. But I'd like to encourage you to take notes. And just look at these things yourself. If you only take down the texts. In the book of Psalms, 40th chapter or division, verse 8, there is a prophecy of Christ. David said, I delight, please follow me, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, or yes, thy law is within my heart. What is God's will? It's his law. David said, I enjoy doing your will, O my God. Your law is in my heart. We read in Romans 2 and verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, You know God's will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of His law. You want to know God's will? You want to know what's best? Paul says, you know when you are instructed out of his law, out of his will, out of his Ten Commandments. Every government has a constitution. Every government has laws. Every government has a law of authority. And that law characterizes that government. God is the king of the great spiritual kingdom which fills the entire universe. He is the king of kings and lord of lords, and God also has a constitution by which he governs his kingdom. And that is his law. Now, whenever a war is fought and won, One of the first things the victor does is to dissolve the constitution of the defeated. Going back to World War II, when the two bombs fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as terrible and awful as they were, Japan surrendered. General Douglas MacArthur issued the Articles of Surrender. And one of the first things he did as conqueror was to dissolve the constitution of Japan and decide with a group of good Japanese how the nation would be governed. And because his new laws were beneficent and profitable, the Japanese fell in love with the man who had defeated them. But the first thing that happened was to do away with the constitution that made men do such infamous things as attack defenseless nations and attack our navy at Pearl Harbor. The surrendered lose their right to a constitution and submit themselves to the victor. If you will allow me to borrow that analogy, we are always talking about surrendering to Christ. Are you with me? We're always talking about giving yourself to Him. Surrender. 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 When one surrenders, he loses, in a sense, his right to conduct 
his own life. And he says to the Lord who has conquered him, I am now your servant. I am now willing to give up my opinions, give up my ways, give up my strong-headedness. I'm willing to give up my ways and accept your ways, your constitution, your laws. And because his laws are beneficent, whenever we make that kind of surrender, we are set free. And joy fills our hearts. Thank God for that. The law of God, the Ten Commandments, is the only part of the Scriptures that God wouldn't let men write for Him. Even holy men. The Bible tells us in Exodus 31 and verse 18, you ought to write that down. He gave Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him on my son, he had two tables of stone written with the finger of God. Written with what? He didn't let holy men do it. He didn't even let good old Moses do it. God wanted us to know that the ultimate authority, the ultimate wisdom, the ultimate leader had written the thing himself. The Bible tells us that he wrote it with his own finger. But this was not the beginning of his law. Shall I prove it? Genesis chapter 26 and verse 5 says, Abraham, who? Abraham kept my charge, my commandments, and my laws. Would you say amen? amen? And Abraham lived hundreds of years before Mount Sinai. Not only that, this was not the beginning of God's law. How do I know? Because the devil used to be in heaven, and he was kicked out. He was kicked out because of what? Sin. Would you say amen to that? Iniquity is the right answer too. The devil was kicked out of heaven because of sin. Now I want to give you a Bible dictionary definition of sin. 1 John 3 and verse 4. There the Bible says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the violation of the law. Sin is the breaking of God's law. The devil sinneth from the beginning, the Bible says. He is the father of sin. And if sin is breaking God's law, the devil broke God's law in heaven. I can tell you right now, he broke the first one. For the first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the devil had decided, I am going to be God. And he broke God's law. He was a sinner from the beginning. What I'm trying to show tonight is that since God is eternal and his government is eternal, it only makes sense that his law is eternal. It existed from eternity past. It goes through the scope of time that we enjoy down here, and it will be his constitution in eternity future. It will never be right to disobey God's law. Would somebody say amen? amen. Adam taught this to his children. And then when they were old enough, Cain, the son of Adam, killed Abel, his brother. The law of God says, thou shalt not kill Cain broke the commandments. He became a sinner. He was driven as a, as a refugee from the presence of God out into the land of Nod. He became a wayfarer. And he fathered a, a, a terrible generation of people that eventually had to be destroyed with a flood. The law goes back as far as God goes, and nobody can go back that far. Finally... Finally, it was necessary to put the law in written form. I'd like to suggest a reason. Adam lived 930 years. Adam lived with Methuselah 
for 243 years, so he reached all the way down to Methuselah. Methuselah lived with Shem for a hundred years, so he could teach Shem. And Shem lived with Abraham for scores and scores of years. So from Adam to Abraham, just three generations. These men lived hundreds of years. But after the flood, the lifespan of man was cut short. So much so that during the Dark Ages, the average lifespan was 35 years. But with science and the Reformation and a return to the Word of God, we now go back to David's Word. We are threescore years and ten. We live about 70 years. Since man's lifespan was cut so miserably short, it became necessary for God to write it out. Before then, it was passed along from patriarch to patriarch. After the flood and the shortening of man's life, Eventually, it became necessary for God to write it. And he didn't let any man do it. He wrote it with his own what? Finger. Wrote it with his own what? Finger. I just wanted to sink in. God wrote it on stone, suggesting permanence. Moses did all of his writing in a book. God wrote on stone with his own finger. And God then gave his law to Moses to be presented to his people and they were supposed to learn it and carry it out to the nations around the earth. What is God like? The law tells us. I want you to listen now. In Psalm 119, verse 142 and verse 172. I'm going to read these to you. Psalm 119. Verse 142 and 172. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. Didn't Jesus say, I am the way, the truth? Want to know what God is like? Look at his law. The 172nd verse says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. They are what? Isn't Christ righteous? You want to know what the law is like? Or rather, what God is like? Read His law. Proverbs 6.23 The commandment is a lamp, and the law is a light. Didn't Jesus say, I am the light of the world? If you come and dwell where I am, you will walk in the light. You want to know what God is like? Look at His law. Now let's get over to the New Testament. Because those who stumble, stumble right here. And they love to stumble over St. Paul's writings. So I'd like to quote Paul. Romans seven twelve. There Paul says, Wherefore the law is holy. It's what? Holy. Beloved, is God holy? Yeah. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just. Is God just? Yeah. And good. Is God good? Oh, look, let me hear your testimony. Is God good? Has He been good to you this week? Oh, He's been good to me. I have been subject to such kindness and such thoughtfulness here, it almost baffles my imagination. It all comes from God. He takes good care of me. Is He good to you? If He is, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. To praise His name. Psalm 19. Verses 7 to 9. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's what? Isn't God perfect? Oh yeah, Jesus said there's none like that except the Father. He's perfect. You want to know what God is like? Look at His law. Men are generally uncomfortable with God's law for some reason. Well, I think I know why. And I'm not just talking about whirlings and sinners who are out in the streets tonight. I'm talking about church people. Ted Turner, the king of cable news, told an Atlanta convention that in his opinion, and here's the problem, it's always some smart man's opinion, and he is a noble and smart gentleman. But he said in his opinion, and this was in the Atlanta Constitution, he said, the Constitution is the newspaper now, I'm not talking about the... He said... That he, in his opinion, the Ten Commandments were out of date. 
And so he wanted to substitute his own, and he gave the sources from which he drew them, and they were Khalil, Gibran, Norman Vincent Peale, the Upward People Singers. This is where he got his. He calls for voluntary initiatives. Nothing to compel or force. You have to volunteer. I've never seen people volunteer to be virtuous. Unless the Holy Spirit is in them. And amongst them, he says, his first commandment would be to love and respect the planet Earth. This world is going to pass away. Now, I love it and respect it, but my hope is not down here. It's up yonder. As beautiful as Phoenix is, this ain't heaven. His second commandment was, promise to treat all persons with dignity, respect, and friendliness. That's good, but that's not God's law. Number three, have no more than two children. It's Ted Turner. Number four, use your best efforts to save what is left of our natural resources. Number five... And I don't need to read all of this. But don't laugh at Ted Turner. The truth is that many who specialize in religion do worse than Ted Turner. Instead of coming up with a substitute law, they say there's no law at all. God did away with it. And I'm talking about professional religionists. Lecturers. Doctors of theology. They have done worse than Ted Turner. They say there is no law. God did away with it. Now, I want to appeal to your intelligence again, and I always have the fortuitous privilege of talking to intelligent people. I'm going to quote the law, because most who say that don't even know what it says. The next time somebody tells you the law is done away with, ask them what the law says and see if they know. Well, I'm going to tell you what it says. And then I'm going to ask you if you can think of any reason why God would do away with it. The first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Do you see anything wrong with that? Now, just be honest. You don't even have to answer out loud. But answer. The second commandment says that you shouldn't make any graven images or idols and bow down and worship statues. Do you see anything wrong with that? The third commandment says that you shouldn't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. If he is really God, respect and reverence him. Is that all right? Can you figure why God would do away with that? The next one says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, everybody has a Sabbath. Some have the right one, some have the wrong one, but they believe in a Sabbath. Can you figure out why God would do away with that? The fifth one says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Can you think of any reason why God would destroy that? We need more of that. With all the delinquency and disrespect in the world today, the next one says, Thou shalt not kill. Can you think of why God would do away with that? With mothers killing their own babies? People walking down the street with Uzis. They call them street sweepers. They just turn them on and mow people down. Can you think of any reason why God would do with that? And the next one says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. With all the heartache in the homes and all the men bringing AIDS back to their wives and wives bringing it back to their husbands, God says, I want husband and wife to respect one another and be true to their vows. Can you see why God would do away with that? Just answer. Just answer. The next one says, thou shalt not steal. When I was a kid, they might steal, but they wouldn't steal from a church. Today, they'll come into church and steal this pulpit. (laughs) Things they don't even need. Why would God do away with that? The next one says, thou shalt not lie. I would expect God to uphold a commandment against lying, wouldn't you? And the last one says, thou shalt not covet. Don't get mad because your neighbor gets a new car and wish he'd have a wreck. 
Don't covet your neighbor's wife nor his children. I ask you to be honest with yourself. Is there anything wrong with that? I have given you all ten. And yet people say they're done away with. God did away with them. Why would he? And people who say that don't mean it. I had a man say to me one day, Brooks, nobody can keep God's law. And he was a clergyman. I said, sir, which one are you breaking? (laughs) And it startled him a little bit. I said, are you true to your wife? Well, of course I am. I said, that's one. Do you lie? No, I don't lie. I said, that's two. Do you steal? Of course not. That's three. There are only ten. Now, I've got to close. I'm taking a little more time than I intended. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, the Bible makes it very clear that the commandments cannot save you. Would you say that with me? The commandments will not save you. That's not the purpose of the commandments. I read it in Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, doing the law, keeping the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, Now listen, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's the purpose of it. Law can't save you. It's not supposed to save you. It's supposed to tell you you need saving. If I get dirt on my face, you could see it, but I wouldn't see it. And James uses the figure of a mirror. He says, when you look into the law and see yourself, If I have dirt on my face, I might not even know it. I might go out in proper company and be embarrassed. Everybody who looked at me would see it, but I couldn't see it. How could I best see it? Looking in a mirror. And when I look in the mirror, I see that my face needs attention. Now I ask you an intelligent question. Can the mirror wash my face? Come on, answer me, can it? Mirrors are not made to wash faces. Mirrors tell you your face needs washing. And if you want to ever get it clean, no need getting mad at the mirror. The mirror has done you a favor. No need going around saying, Jesus did away with mirrors. When he died on the cross, he did away with the mirrors. Your face will stay dirty from then on. If you want to get clean, respect the mirror. Be thankful that the mirror told you that you were embarrassing yourself. Then leave the mirror and get yourself a pan of water and some soap and scrub your dirty face. And once you scrub your face, you can go back to that same mirror. And that same mirror will say, now you're all right. The law of God is his mirror. If you sin, it's like having dirt on your face. But the law can't save you. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And when you confess your sins, He will forgive your sins. And the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, He will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And when you're clean, I don't care what you've done. You might have cheated on your wife. You might have been a fornicator, a liar, a gambler, a drug addict. Doesn't matter. If he cleanses you, you can go look in that same mirror. And Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation. You're no longer condemned and embarrassed. The law will tell you you're all right now. For you're walking in conformity to God's will. A Christian's lifestyle then is changed. If he's clean, he stops lying. If he's still there... He becomes pure. If he's a murderer, he stops killing. If he's a thief, he stops stealing. And thus, he is obedient to the law. Not to be saved, but because he is saved. Would you say amen out there? And now Jesus says, Jesus said, I don't want you to feel under pressure. John 14, 15, that's the last text I'm going to ask you to write. Unless you want to write one from the screen. Jesus says, If ye love me. What did I say? I'm going to quote the whole thing, but I want it to sink in a little at a time. I've got my screen button in my hand. 
Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now that's what he says explicitly. What he says implicitly is, if you don't love me, forget it. You can't keep it. The only way you can obey God is to love him and let him come into your heart. Then he will obey his own law in you and give you credit for it. That is called justification. And that becomes sanctification. So, if you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. What is God like? He gave his law to Moses. Codified after thousands of years of being passed from patriarch to patriarch, from father to son. God wrote it with his own what? Now that's very important. God wrote it with his own finger, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible tells us what sin is. And the Bible says in 1 John 3 and verse 4, read it with me. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is. That's what sin is. I listen to people who defame the law saying, oh, we're here to save sinners. What are you going to save them from if there's no law? If there is no law, there is no sin. For sin is breaking the law. Do away with the law, you do away with sin. What are you saving them from? If there is no law, let us go on. The law is something to be loved. It's not a problem. It's a privilege. Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so that death hath passed upon all men, for how many have sinned? So we all need saving. And sin is the breaking of God's law. And so God gave to Moses and to Abraham and to Adam before him his law. And the Bible says, Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Genesis 26, 5. And ladies and gentlemen, not 55. And ladies and gentlemen... That man, Abraham, lived hundreds of years before Mount Sinai. Now here is a long text. These are the words of Jesus. We love Jesus. We say, he said, if you really love me, do what? But many who profess to love him ignore what he says. Matthew 5, 17 to 19. Jesus said, think not. The understood subject is you. You, think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. One jot or one tittle. What is a jot and a tittle? The dot above an eye in Hebrew, the crossing of a T. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one. Break how many? You don't have to break them all. You can go to prison and find a man on death row. He hadn't broken them all. Jesus said. Who said it? Jesus said. Whosoever therefore shall break one. And then he said, of these least commandments. Pick out the one you consider the least consequential. And Jesus said, if you break the least one. And shall teach men so, the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the saved shall be called great. That's why I want to teach them. And it's not enough to teach them, you got to do them. And by His grace, I can do them. I don't need any man on earth calling me great. But I sure love the idea that when my name comes up in glory, I'm called great in the kingdom of heaven. Would somebody say amen to that? And those are the words of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, the one they love to quote. Tomorrow night, my subject is capricious grace. You've heard it. We are not under the law. We're under grace. I say amen to that and say you ought to be here tomorrow night. 
it will be as clear as the nose on my face. St. Paul doesn't double talk. He doesn't talk out of both sides of his mouth. He either is telling the truth all the time, or we have no right to pay him any attention. It was St. Paul who said, Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. And not only that, but this Decalogue, what is the purpose of it? Why did God give it? I'm reviewing with this particular message. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. You can't keep enough commandments to earn your way to hope, to heaven. Well, then what's it for? By the law is the what? The law says, thou shalt not steal. If you steal, you're sinning. The law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. If you're not true to your wife or husband, you're sinning. The law says, thou shalt not kill. You go out and kill people, you're sinning. By the law is the knowledge of sin. That is his purpose. It is not supposed to save anybody. What shall I say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, said Paul. This is Paul whom they love to quote. Is the law sin? God forbid. Then he said, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. You wouldn't even know it was wrong to steal, unless the law told you. How sensible, how reasonable, how clear. That's what Paul said. And then this enemy called the devil. The Bible says that this devil sinneth from the beginning. He broke God's law from the beginning. We can't even go back that far. We are creatures of time, caught in the scope of time. God is eternal. We can't understand it. The best explanation is like a cycle. Eternity past runs into eternity future, but not us. And yet, he will give us everlasting life. But from the beginning, Satan was a lawbreaker, a sinner. For this was the purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And somebody ought to say amen. amen. He that saith, I know him. 1 John 2, 4. New Testament, you notice I'm staying in the New Testament. 1 John 2, 4 says, He that saith, I know him. And keepeth not his commandments is a what? Now that's tough. If I say you are telling a lie, it simply means what you're saying right now isn't true. But if I say you are a liar, that's an attack on your character. It means you're not only lying now, you lie all the time. And that's what the Bible says. And so my friends, Jesus says, let's read it now. He said, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. New Testament, Jesus. Amen. And then in tenderness, He appeals. Do you really love me? If. The subjunctive. If. If. If you love me. I need more than protestations of love. If you love me, prove it. If you love me, do what? The words of Jesus. Tender words. Nothing to be heard about and offended about. Did he love us? He proved it. He went to the cross. They dropped that 300 pound instrument of torture on his torn and bleeding shoulders. And he did his best to carry it, but because he had been beaten until his back was like a raw steak, he fell beneath the cross. And finally, they called a black man from Africa, Simon of Cyrene. And that black man reached down with one hand and took up that cross. And with the other, he offered help to the Son of God. And he was never the same again. But Jesus went all the way to the top of the mountain of death prostrated himself on the gibbet and they brought out the rusty nails and they brought the hammer down and they fastened him to a gibbet and the Son of God was lifted up between heaven and earth a fit place for a Savior to die Jesus did it why? for God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Now, do you love me? If you love me, keep my commandments. The Son of God, the Savior of the world, proved his love to us. Oh, my friends, we need something to pray about tonight. I'm praying tonight by the grace of God that everybody in this room will have a clearer understanding of God's commandments and its relationship to the Christian life. And I hope you as I feel, I want Jesus to walk with me. All along my pilgrim journey, I want Jesus to walk with me so that I may walk in harmony with His will. Is that your desire? If it is, let's close this service by standing and saying, Yes, Lord, I want to live in harmony with your will. Bow your heads. Shut out all human traffic. Concentrate on Jesus, the Lamb of God. And pray to love him back. Oh, my Father, here we stand. Look at us, Lord. Unworthy though we are, in our hearts right now, we feel that we love you. And we know that words are not enough. Deeds prove our love. Thou hast said, I will save you from sin. And I will strengthen you. Yea, I will uphold you by the right hand of my power. And for that we love you. And you said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Lord, look at every soul in this auditorium. It is half dark in here. I can't even see them all. I can't see those fine young people standing in the balcony. But you see everyone. And I pray that you would affect our minds tonight. Our attitudes and our way of thinking. And bring us into conformity to thy will. For you have said to us, not everyone that shouts and prays and preaches will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Oh, my Father, save us, please, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, the blood of the Lamb. We beg for Jesus' sake. There is someone who cares. When truth is strange to you. There is someone who cares when his will you want to do. There is someone who cares and he can bring you through. For that someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares his law reveals his way. There is someone who cares when you need strength to obey. There is someone who cares. His power is available today. Well, that's someone who cares. Is Jesus. And now, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Peace in your hearts. Peace in your homes. We pray in the name of Jesus. Let everybody say... Amen.